Um, what's up, Doc? Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next thrilling and exciting and astounding and amazing, shocking, ebullient, effervescent, immutable, irreproachable, remorseless, uh, incalcitrant, uh, episode of the reading cow from another world continuing with um anecdota chapter 17 of procopius for your edification bedtime stories thing show that this is thanks for tuning in we continue 17 how she saved 500 harlots from a life of sin I have told earlier in this narrative what she did to Belisarius, Photius, and Buzis. There were two members of the blue faction, Cilicians, by birth, who, with a mob of others, offered violence. Can anything go right? To Kalinicus, governor of the second Cilicia. And when his groom, who was standing near his master, tried to protect him, they slew the fellow before the eyes of the governor and all the people. The governor, convicting the two of this and many previous murders, sentenced them to death. Theodora heard of this, and to show her preference for the blues, crucified Kalinicus. Without troubling to remove him from his office on the spot where the murderers had been buried. There you have it, folks. The emperor affected uh, to lament and uh, mourn the death of his governor and sat around grumbling and making threats against those responsible for the deed. But he did nothing except to seize the estate of the dead man. Mm -hmm. Fancy that. Theodora also devoted considerable attention to the punishment of women caught in carnal sin. She picked up more than 500 harlots in the forum who earned a miserable living by selling themselves there for three oboles and sent them to the opposite mainland where they were locked up in the uh, monastery called Repentance to force them to reform their way of life. Some of them, however, threw themselves from the parapets at night and thus freed themselves from an undesired salvation. Um, <clears throat> there were in Constantinople two girls, sisters of a very illustrious family. Not only had their father and grandfather been consuls, but uh, even before that, their ancestors had been uh, sen senators. These girls had both married early, but became widows when their husbands died, and immediately, Theodora, accusing them of living too merrily, chose new husbands for them, uh, two common and disgusting fellows, and commanded the marriage to take place. Fearing this repulsive fate, the sisters fled to the church of St. Sophia, and running to the holy water, clung tightly to the font. Yet such privations and ill-treatment did the empress inflict upon them there that to escape from their sufferings they finally agreed to accept the proposed nuptials <clears throat> for no place was sacred or inviolable to Theodora. Thus involuntarily these ladies were mated to beggarly and negligible men uh, far beneath their rank, although they had many well-born suitors. Their mother, who was also a, wi a widow, attended the ceremony without daring to protest or even weep at their misfortune. Later, Theodora saw her mistake and tried to console them to the public detriment, for she made their new husbands dukes. Even this brought no comfort to the young women, for endless and intolerable woes were inflicted on practically all their subjects by these men, as I have <coughs> told elsewhere. <coughs> they were jerks. Theodora, however, cared nothing for the interest of office or government or anything else, if only she accomplished her will... She had accidentally become pregnant by one of her lovers when she was still on the stage, and perceiving her ill luck too late, tried all the usual measures to cause a miscarriage, but decided every artifice was unable to prevail against nature at this advanced stage of development. <clears throat> Finding nothing else could be done, she abandoned the attempt, 
and was compelled to give birth to the child. The father of the baby, seeing that Theodora was at her wit's end and vexed because motherhood interfered with her usual recreations, and suspecting with good reason that she would do away with the child, took the infant from her, naming him John, and sailed with the baby to Arabia. Later, when he was on the verge of death and John was a lad of 14, the father told him the whole story about his mother. So the boy, after he had performed the last rites for his departed father, shortly after came to Constantinople and announced his presence to the Empress's chamberlains. And they, not conceiving the possibility of her acting so inhumanly, reported to the mother that her son John had come. Fearing the story would get to the ears of her husband, Theodora bade her son to be brought face to face with her. As soon as he entered, she handed him over to one of her servants, who was ordinarily entrusted with such commissions, and in what manner the poor lad was removed from the world, I cannot say, for no one has ever seen him since, not even after the queen died. The ladies of the court at this time were nearly all of abandoned morals. They ran no risk in being faithless to their husbands, as the sin brought no penalty, even if caught in the act, they were unpunished. For all they had to do was go to the Empress, claim the charge was not proven, and start a countersuit against their husbands. The latter, defeated without a trial, had to pay a fine of twice the dower, and were usually whipped and sent to prison. And the next time they saw their adulterous wives again, the ladies would be daintily entertaining their lovers more openly than ever. Indeed, many of the latter gained promotion and pay for their amorous services. After one such experience, most men who suffered these outrages from their wives preferred thereafter to be complacent instead of being whipped, and gave them every liberty rather than seem to be spying on their affairs. Theodore's idea was to control everything in the state to suit herself. Civil and ecclesiastical offices were all in her hand, and there was always only one thing she was always careful to inquire about and guard as the standard of her appointments, that no honest gentleman should be given high rank, for fear he would have scruples against obeying her commands. <clears throat> she arranged all marriages as if that were her divine right, and voluntary betrothals before ceremony were unknown. A wife would suddenly be found for a man, chosen not because she pleased him, which is customary, even among the barbarians, but because Theodora willed it. And the same was true of brides who were forced to take men they did not desire. Frequently, she even made the bride jump out of her marriage bed, and for no reason at all sent the bridegroom away before he had reached the chorus of his nuptial song. And her only angry words would be that the girl displeased her. Among the many to whom she did this were Leon... Leontius, the referendar, and Saturninus, the son of uh, Hermogenes, that gloomy guy, the master of offices. Now this Saturninus was betrothed to a maiden cousin, freeborn and a good girl, whom her father Cyril had promised him in marriage just after the death of Hermogenes, when their bridal chamber was in readiness. Theodora arrested the groom who was conducted to another nuptial couch, where, weeping and groaning terribly, he was compelled to wed Chrysomalo's daughter. Chrysomalo herself had formerly been a dancer and a hetera. At this time, she lived in the palace with another woman of the same name and one called Indaro, having given up Cupid and the stage to be of service to the queen. Saturninus, lying down finally to pleasant dreams with his new bride, discovered she was already unmaiden, then later told one of his friends that this newfound mate came to him not imperforate. Um, <laughs> when this comment got to Theodora, she ordered her servants, charging him with impious disregard of the solemnity of his matrimonial oath, to hoist him up like a schoolboy who had been a saucy to his teacher, and after whipping him on his backsides, told him not to be such a fool thereafter. What she did to John the Cappadocian I have told elsewhere, and need add only that her treatment of him was due to her anger, not at his transgressions against the state, and a proof of this is that those who later did even more terrible things to their subjects met no similar fate from her, but because 
he had not only dared to oppose her in other things, but had denounced her before the emperor with the result that she was all but estranged from her husband. I am explaining this now, for it is in this book, as I said in the foreword, that I necessarily tell the real truths and motives of events. When she confined, confined him in Egypt after he had suffered such humiliations as I have previously described, she was not even satisfied with the man's punishment, but never ceased hunting for false witnesses against him. Four years later, she was able to find two members of the Green Party who had taken part in the insurrection at Cyzicus, who were said to have shared in the assault upon the bishop. These two she overwhelmed with flattery and threats, and one of them, inspired by her promises, accused John of the murder, while the other utterly refused to be an accomplice in this libel. Even when he was so injured by the torture that he seemed about to die on the spot. Ouch. Consequently, for all her efforts, she was unable to cause John's death's death on this pretext. But the two young men had their right hands cut off. One because he was unwilling to bear false witness, the other that her conspiracy might not be utterly obvious. Thus she was able to do things in public sight, and still nobody knew exactly what she had done. Blink. Blink. Holy smokes, folks. Uh, the cow is trying to keep it together. Hold on to his sanity. Okay, now, this is where this gets interesting. 18. How Justinian killed a trillion people. I didn't know they had that many people back then. Have we ever had a trillion people? Maybe it was a typo or something. Oh. Okay, here we go. Continuing the thrilling... Uh, <clears throat> saga. The Justinian was not a man, but a demon, as I have said, in human form. One might prove by considering the enormity of the evils he brought upon mankind. For in the monstrousness of his actions, the power of a fiend, a fiend, is manifest. Certainly, an accurate reckoning of all those whom he destroyed would be impossible. I think for anyone but God. Can anything go right for me today? I think for anyone but God to make <clears throat> certainly an accurate reckoning of all those whom he destroyed would be impossible, I think, for anyone but God to make. Sooner could one number, I fancy, the sands of the sea than the men this emperor murdered. Examining the countries that he made desolate of inhabitants, I would say he slew a trillion people. Uh, for Libya, vast as it is, he's so devastated that you would have to go a long way to find a single man, and he would be remarkable. Yet, 80,000 vandals capable of bearing arms had dwelt there, and as for their wives and children and servants, who could guess their number? Yet still more numerous than these were the Mauritanians, who, with their wives and children, were all exterminated. And again, many Roman soldiers and those who followed them to Constantinople, the earth now covers, so that if, if one should venture to say that five million men perished in Libya alone, he would not, I imagine, be telling the half of it. The reason for this was that after the Vandals were defeated, Justinian planned not how he might best strengthen his hold on the country, nor how by safeguarding the interest of those who were loyal to him he might have the goodwill of his subjects. But instead, he foolishly recalled Belisarius at once, 
on the charge that the latter intended to make himself king, an idea of which Belisarius was utterly incapable, and so that he might manage affairs uh, there himself and be able to plunder the whole of Libya. Sending commissioners to value the province, he imposed grievous taxes where before there had been none. Whatever lands were most valuable, he seized and prohibited the Arians from observing their religious ceremonies. Negligent toward sending necessary supplies to the soldiers, he was over strict with them in other ways, wherefore mutinies arose resulting in the deaths of many. For he was never able to abide by any established customs, but naturally drew everything into confusion and disturbance. Italy, which is not less than thrice as large as Libya, was everywhere desolated of men, even worse than the other country. And from this, the count of those who perished there may be imagined. The reason for what happened in Italy I have already made plain. All of his crimes in Libya were repeated here. Sending his auditors to Italy, he soon upset and ruined everything. The rule of the Goths before this war had extended from the land of the Gauls to the boundaries of Dacia, where the city of Sirmium is. The Germans had Cis held Cisalpine Gaul and most of the land of the Venetians when the Roman army arrived in Italy. Sirmium and the neighboring country was in the hands of the Jepidae. All of these he utterly depopulated, for those who did not die in battle perished of disease and famine, which as usual followed in the train of war. Illyria and all of Thrace, that is, from the Ionian Gulf to the suburbs of Constantinople, including Greece and the Chersonese, were overrun by Huns, Slavs, and Antes almost every year from the time when Justinian took over the Roman Empire and intolerable things they did to the inhabitants. For in each of these incursions, I should say, more than 200,000 Romans were slain or enslaved, so that all this country became like a desert, uh, became a desert like that of Scythia. Such were the results of the wars in Libya and Europe. Meanwhile, the Saracens were continuously making inroads on the Romans of the east from the land of Egypt to the boundaries of Persia, and so completely did their work that in all this country few were left, and it will never be possible, I fear, to find out how many thus perished. Also, the Persians under Khosros three times invaded the rest of this Roman territory, sacked the cities in either killing or carrying away the men they captured in the cities and the country, emptied the land of inhabitants every time they invaded it. From the time when they invaded Col Colchis, ruin has befallen themselves and the Lazi and the Romans. For neither the Persians nor the Saracens the Huns or the Slavs or the rest of the barbarians were able to withdraw from Roman territory undamaged. In their inroads, and still more in their sieges of cities and in battles where they prevailed over opposing forces, they shared in disastrous losses quite as much. Not only the Romans, but nearly all the barbarians thus felt Justinian's bloodthirstiness. For while Khosros himself was bad enough, as I have duly shown elsewhere, Justinian was the one who each time gave him an occasion for the war. For he took no heed to fit his policies to an appropriate time, but did everything at the wrong moment. In time of peace or truce, he ever craftily contrived to find pretext for war with his neighbors, while in time of war he unreasonably lost interest and hesitated too long in preparing for the campaign, grudging the necessary expenses, and instead of putting his mind on the war, gave his attention to stargazing and research as to the nature of God. Yet he would not abandon hostilities, since he was so bloodthirsty and tyrannical. Even with, when thus unable to conquer the enemy because of his negligence in meeting the situation. Sounds familiar. Yeah. So while he was emperor, the whole earth ran red with the blood of nearly all the Romans and the barbarians. Such were the results of the wars throughout the whole empire during this time. But the civil strife in Constantinople 
and in every other city, if the dead were reckoned, would total no smaller number of slain than those who perished in the wars, I believe, since justice and impartial punishment were seldom directed against the offenders, and each of the two factions tried to win the favor of the emperor over the other, neither party kept the peace. Each, according to his smile or his frown, was now terrified, now encouraged. Sometimes they attacked each other in full strength, sometimes in smaller groups, or even lay in ambush against the first single man of the opposite party who came along. For 32 years, without ever ceasing, they performed outrages against each other, many of them being punished with death by the municipal prefect. However, punishment for these offenses was mostly directed against the Greens. Furthermore, the persecution of the Samaritans and the so-called heretics filled the Roman realm with blood. Uh, let this present recapitulation suffice to recall what I have described more fully a little while since. Such were the things done to all mankind by the demon in, the f in flesh for which Justinian as emperor was responsible. But what evils he wrought against men by some hidden power and diabolic force I shall now relate. During his rule over the Romans, many disasters of various kinds occurred, which some said were due to the presence and artifices of the devil, and others considered were affected by the divinity, who, disgusted with the Roman Empire, had turned away from it and given the country up to the old one. The Skirtus River flooded Edessa, creating countless sufferings among the inhabitants, as I have elsewhere written. The Nile, rising as usual but not subsiding in the customary season, brought terrible calamities to the people there, as I ha have also previously recounted. The Sidnus inundated Tarsus, covering almost a whole city for many days, and did not subside until it had done irreparable damage. Earthquakes destroyed Antioch, the leading city of the east, Seleucia, which is situated nearby, and Anazarbus, most renowned city in Cilicia. Who could number those that perished in these metropoles? Yet, one must add also those who lived in Ebora and Amasia, the chief city of Pontus, and Polybatus in Phrygia, called Polymede by the Pisidians, in Lychnidus, in Epirus, and Corinth, all thickly inhabited cities from of old. All of these were destroyed by earthquakes during this time, with the loss of almost all their inhabitants. And then came the plague, which I have previously mentioned, killing half at least of those who had survived the earthquakes. To so many men came their doom when Justinian first came to direct, to direct the Roman state and later possessed the throne of autocracy. 19. How he seized all the wealth of the Romans and threw it away. How he seized all wealth I will next discuss, recalling first a vision, which at the beginning of Justinian's rules was revealed to one of illustrious rank in a dream. In this dream, he said, he seemed to be standing on the shore of the sea somewhere in Constantinople, across the water from Chalcedon, and saw Justinian there in mid-channel. And first, Justinian drank up all the water of the sea, so that he presently appeared to be standing on the mainland, there, uh, there being no longer any waves to break against it. Uh, then other water, heavy with filth and rubbish, roaring out of the subterranean sewers, proceeded to cover the land, and this too he drank, a second time drying up the bed of the channel. This is what the vision in the dream disclosed. Now Justinian, when his uncle Justin came to the throne, found the state well provided with public funds. For Anastasius, who had been the most provident and economical of all monarchs, fearing, which indeed happened, that the inheritor of his empire should find himself in need of money, would perhaps plunder his subjects, filled all the treasuries to their brim with gold before he completed his span of life. All of this Justinian, Justinian immediately exhausted. Uh, between his senseless building program on the coast and his lavish presence to the barbarians, though one might have thought that it would take the most extravagant of emperors a hundred years to disperse such wealth, for the treasurers and those in charge of the other imperial properties had been able during Anastasius' rule of more than 27 years, 
over the Romans easily to accumulate 3,200 gold centenaries, and of all these, nothing was left, for it had been squandered by this man while Justin still lived, as I have already related. What he illegally confiscated and wasted during his lifetime, no tale, no reckoning, no count could ever make manifest. For like an ever-flowing river, swallowing more each day, he pillaged his subjects to disgorge it straight, straightway on the barbarians. Having thus carried away the public wealth, he turned his eye upon his private subjects. Most of them he immediately robbed of their estates, snatching them arbitrarily by force, bringing false charges against whoever in Constantinople and each other city were reputed to be rich. Some he accused of polytheism, others of heresy against the Orthodox Christian faith, some of pederasty, others of love affairs with nuns or other unlawful intercourse, some of starting sedition or of favoring the grains or treason against himself or anything else. Or he made himself the arbitrary heir of the dead and even of the living when he could. Such were the subtleties of his actions and how he profited from the insurrection against himself which is called Nika making himself heir to the senators I have already shown, and how, some time before the sedition broke out, he privately robbed each man of his estate. To all the barbarians on every occasion he gave great sums, to those of the east and to those of the west, to the north and the south, as far as Britain, and all over the inhabited earth, so that the nation whose very names we had never heard of, we now learn to know, Seeing their ambassadors for the first time, when they learned of this man's folly, they came to him and Constantinople in floods from the whole world, and he, with no hesitation, but overjoyed at this, and thinking it good luck to drain the Romans of their prosperity and fling it to the barbarian men, or to the waves of the sea, daily sent each one home with his arms full of presents. Thus all the barbarians became masters of all the wealth of the Romans, either being presented with it by the emperor or by ravaging the Roman Empire, selling their prisoners for ransom and bartering for truces. And the prophecy of the dream I mentioned above came to pass in this visible reality. Twenty. Debasing of the quaestor ship. He also had contrived other ways of plundering his subjects, which I will now describe as well as I can, by which he robbed them not at once, but little by little of their entire fortunes. First he appointed a new municipal magistrate with the power to license shopkeepers to sell their wares at whatever prices they desired, for which privilege they paid an annual tax. Accordingly, people buying their provisions in these shops had to pay three times what the stuff was worth and complainants had no redress, though great harm was thus done, for the magistrates saw to it that the imperial tax was fattened accordingly, which was to their advantage. Thus the government officials shared in this disgraceful business, while the shopkeepers, empowered to act illegally, cheated unbearably those who had to buy from them, not only by raising their prices many times over, as I have said, but by defrauding customers in other unheard of ways. Again, he licensed many monopolies, as they are called, selling the freedom of his subjects to those who were willing to undertake its reprehensi this reprehensible traffic. After he had exacted his price for the privilege, to those who made this arrangement with him, he gave the power to manage the business however they pleased, and he sold his, this privilege openly, even to all the other magistrates. And since the emperor always got his little share of the plundering, these officials and their subordinates in charge of the work did their robbing with small anxiety. As if the formerly appointed magistrates were not enough for this purpose, he created two new ones, though the municipal prefect had formerly been able to look after all criminal charges. His real reason for the change was, of course, so that he could have additional informers, and thus misuse the innocent with more celerity. Hmm. Of the two new officials, one nominally appointed to punish thieves, was called Praetor of the People. The other was charged with the punishment of cases of pederasty, illegal intercourse with women, blasphemy and heresy, and his official name was Quaestor. Now the Praetor, whenever he found 
anything very valuable among the stolen goods that came to his notice was supposed to give it to the emperor and say that no owner had appeared to claim it. In this way, the emperor continually got possession of priceless goods, and the quaestor, when he condemned persons coming before him, confiscated as much as he pleased of their properties, and the emperor shared with him each time in the lawlessly gained riches of other people. For the subordinates of these magistrates neither produced accusers nor offered witnesses when these cases came to trial, but during all this time the accused were put to death and their property seized without due trial and examination. See what can happen? Later, this murdering devil ordered these officials and the municipal prefect to deal with all criminal charges on equal terms, telling them to vie with each other to see which of them could destroy the most people in the shortest time. And one of them asked him at once, they say, <clears throat> if somebody is sometime denounced before all three of us, which of us shall have jurisdiction over the case? Whereupon he replied, whichever of you acts faster than the rest. Thus shamelessly he de debased the quaestor's office, which former emperors almost without exception had held in high regard, taking care that the men they appointed to it were experienced and wise, law-abiding and uncorruptible by bribes, since otherwise it would be a calamity to the state if men holding this high office were ignorant or avaricious. But the first man that this emperor appointed to the office was Tribonian, whose actions I have fully related elsewhere. And when Tribonian departed from this world, Justinian seized a portion of his estate. Though a son and many other children were left destitute when the fellow ended the final day of his life, Junilus, a Libyan, was next appointed to this office, a man who had never even heard the law, for he was not a rhetorish, a rhetorician, a rhetorician. He, he knew the Latin letters, but as far as Greek went, he had never even gone to school and was unable to speak the language. Frequently, when he tried to say a Greek word, he was laughed at by his servants. And he was so damned greedy for base gain that he thought nothing of publicly selling the emperor's decrees. For one gold coin, he would hold out his palm to anybody without hesitation, and for not less than seven years' time, the state shared ridicule earned by this petty grafter. When Janilus completed the measure of his life, Constantine was appointed quaestor, a man not unacquainted with law, but exceeding young and without actual experience in court, and the most thievish bully among men. Of this person, Justinian was very fond and became his bosom friend since through him the emperor saw he could steal and run the office as he wished. Consequently, Constantine had great wealth in a short time and assumed an air of prodigious pomp with his nose in the clouds despising all men, and even those who wanted to offer him large bribes had to entrust him to those who were in his special confidence to offer him together with their request, for it was never possible to meet or talk with him, except when he was running to the emperor or had just left him, and even then he trotted by in, great, in a great hurry, lest his time be wasted by somebody who had no money to give him. This is what the emperor did to the quaestorship. 21. The sky tax and how border armies were forbidden to punish invading uh, barbarians. The prefect in charge of the praetors each year handed over to the emperor more than 30 centenaries in addition to the public taxes. This tribute was called the sky tax to show, I suppose, that it was not a regular duty or assessment, but as it were, fell, but as it were, fell into his hands by chance out of the sky. It should have been called the villainy tax, for in its name the magistrates will rob their subjects worse than ever on the ground that they had to hand it over to the autocrat, while they themselves acquired a king's fortune in no time. For this Justinian left them unpunished, awaiting the time when they should have gained immense riches. As soon as this happened, he brought some charge against them, for which there was no defense, and confiscated their entire property all at once, as he had done to John of Cappadocia. Everyone appointed to office during this period, of course, became immensely wealthy at once, with two exceptions. Focus, whom I have mentioned elsewhere as an utterly honest man who remained uncorrupted by gain during his office, and Bassus, who was appointed later, 
Neither of these gentlemen held their office for a year, but were removed after a few months as useless and unsuited to the times. But if I went into all the details, this book would never end. Suffice it to say that all the rest of the magistrates in Constantinople were equally guilty. Also, everywhere else in the Roman Empire, Justinian did the same. Picking out the worst scoundrels he could find, he sold them the offices that they were to corrupt for large sums of money. Indeed, an honest man, or one with any sense at all, would never think of throwing away his own money on the chance of getting it back by robbing the innocent. When Justinian had collected this money from such bargainers, he gave them complete power over their subjects by which pillaging the country and the inhabitants they were to become rich. And since they had borrowed money at heavy interest to pay the emperor for their magistracies, as soon as they arrived in the cities of their jurisdiction, they treated their subjects with every kind of evil, caring for nothing but how they might fulfill their agreements with their creditors and themselves, thereafter be listed among the super wealthy. Bling! They saw no peril and felt no shame in this conduct. Rather, they anticipated that the more they wrongfully killed and plundered, the higher would be their reputation. For the name of murderer and robber would prove the energy of their service. However, as soon as he heard these officials had become adequately wealthy, Justinian snared them with a fitting pretext and straightway seized their fortunes in one swoop. Suckers. <laughs> he passed a law that... Uh, Candidates for offices must swear they would keep themselves clean of all graft and never give or receive it any bribe as officials. And all the curses that were named by the ancients he invoked on any who should violate this agreement. But the law was not over a year old before he himself, disregarding its words and maledictions, shamelessly put these offices up for sale, and not secretly, but in the public forum. And the buyers of the offices, breaking their oaths also, plundered more than ever. Later, he contrived another unheard-of scheme, the offices of which he believed to be the most powerful in Constantinople and the other large cities. He decided not to sell any longer as he had been doing, but put them in the hands of picked men on a fixed salary who were commanded to turn over all revenues to himself. And these men, after receiving their pay work, ceased fearlessly and carried off, carried off everything on earth, going... <coughs> going around in the name of their office to rob the subjects. The emperor was always very careful to choose for his agents men who were truly, of all people, the worst scoundrels, and he had no trouble finding those who were bad enough. When indeed he appointed the first rascals to office and their power brought to light their corruption, we were astonished that nature had produced such evil in human form. But when the successors to these offices later went far beyond the first occupants in villainy, men were at a loss to see how their predecessors could have been thought to be wicked, since in comparison to the new officials, the former had <clears throat> and the third been noble. <laughs> and, and the third and, and the third been noble gentlemen in their actions set and those who followed then outherited the second lot in every kind of depravity, and uh, by their ingenuity in inventing new methods of bringing false charges gave all their predecessors the name of being virtuous and honest. As the evil progressed, it was eventually demonstrated that the wickedness of man has no natural limit, but when it feeds on the experience of the past and is given the opportunity to mistreat its victims, it is encouraged to such a degree that only those who are oppressed by it can measure it. And thus were the Romans treated by their magistrates. After armies of the hostile Huns had several times enslaved and plundered inhabitants of the Roman Empire, the Thracian and Illyrian generals planned to attack them on their retreat, but gave up the idea when they were shown letters from the Emperor Justinian forbidding them to attack the barbarians on the ground that alliance with them was necessary to the Romans against the Goths, forsooth, or some other foe. And after this, these barbarians ravaged the country as if they were, were the foe, and enslaved the Romans there, and laden with booty and captives, 
These friends and allies of the Romans returned to their homes. Often some of the farmers of these regions, induced by longing for their children and wives who had been carried off to slavery, formed into bands and attacked the Huns, uh, killing, uh, uh, kill, capturing their horses. Hmm? Capturing their horses, ladening many, and with spoils. But the consequence of their success was unfortunate, for agents were sent from Constantinople to beat and torture them and seize their property until they had given up all the horses they had taken from the barbarians. 22. Further corruption in high places. Now, when the emperor and Theodora dismissed John of Cappadocia, they wished to appoint a successor to his office and agreed to choose a still baser rogue. So they looked everywhere for such an instrument of tyranny, examining all manner of men that they might be able to ruin their subjects the faster. For the time being, they appointed Theodotus to the office, a man who was by no means good, but still not bad enough to satisfy them. And meanwhile, they continued their general search till finally, almost to their surprise, they discovered a banker named Peter, a Syrian by birth, surnamed Barsiamis, Barsiamis, who after years of sitting at the copper money changers table had made himself rich by thievish malpractices, being gi uh, gifted at stealing obols which he could filter into the eyes of customers by the quickness of his fingers, he was not only smart at his sleight of hand thievery, but if he were ever detected would swear it was a mistake covering up the sins of his hands with the impudence of his tongue. Enlisting the Praetorian Guard, he behaved so outrageously that Theodora was delighted with him and decided he could most easily serve her in the worst of her nefarious schemes. So Theodotus, who had succeeded the Cappadocian, was straightway removed from office and Peter appointed in his place, and he did everything to their taste, cheating all the soldiers of their due pay without the slightest shame or fear. He also offered offices for sale to a greater extent than ever to those who did not hesitate to engage in this impious traffic for dishonored positions. And he openly licensed those who bought these offices to use as they wished the lives and substance of their subjects. For he claimed himself and granted to whoever paid the price of a province the right to destroy and ravage without restriction. This sale of human lives proceeded from the first officer of the state, and by him the contract for the ruin of cities was made. Through the principal law courts and in the public forum went the licensed bandit who was given the name of Collector, collector of the money paid for high offices, which was in turn extorted from the despairing people. And of all the imperial agents, many of who, whom were men of repute, Peter selected for his own service those who were villains. Mm. In this he was not unique, for those who held the same office before and after him were equally dishonest. So were the master of offices, the pal palatine treasurers of the public and the emperor's private monies, and those in charge of his personal estates, and in short, all who held public offices in Constantinople, and the other cities. Uh, for from the time when this tyrant first managed the affairs of state in each department, the ministers without any justification claimed the monies pertaining to that department for themselves whenever he did not take them himself. And the subordinates of these officials, suffering the extremes of penury during all this time, were compelled to serve in the manner of slaves. Most of the great stores of grain that had been kept in Constantinople had rotted but he forced each of the cities of the East to buy what was not fit for human consumption, and he made them pay not what was the usual pr price for the best grain, but a still higher rate, so that the purchas purchasers who had thrown away large sums of money buying at such extravagant prices had then to throw the rotten grain into the sea or down the sewers. Then the grain that was still sound and wholesome, of which there was great abundance, he decided to sell to the cities that were in danger of famine. In this way, he made twice the money which the public collectors had formerly taken by the sale of this grain. The next year, however, the harvests were not so ample, and the grain transports arrived in Constantinople with less than the necessary supply. 
Peter, worried over the situation, determined to buy a large quantity of grain in Bithynia, Phrygia, and Thrace, so the inhabitants of these regions were forced the heavy task of bringing their harvest down to the seacoast and to transport it at considerable peril to Constantinople, where they received a miserably small price. So great indeed were their losses that they would have been glad to give their grain outright to the state and pay a fine for that privilege. This is the grievous burden which was called cooperative buying. But when even thus the supplies of grains in Constantinople were insufficient for its need, needs, many denounced the system before the emperor, and at the same time nearly all the soldiers, because they had not been given their due pay, assembled mutinously throughout the city, and created a great uproar. The emperor turned now against Peter and decided to remove him from office because of the above-mentioned complaints, and since he heard he had hidden a devilishly large amount of plunder of which he had robbed the state, which was indeed the case. But Theodora would not let her husband do this, for she was marvelously delighted with Barsiames, I suppose, because of his wickedness and his remarkable cruelty to his subjects. For she herself was utterly savage and bursting with inhumanity, and thought those who served her should be as nearly as possible of a character with herself. They say, too, that she had been involuntarily charmed by magic to become Peter's friend, for this Barsiames was a devotee of sorcerers and demons, and was admittedly a member of the Manichaeans. Although the emperor, empress had heard all this, she did not withdraw her favor from the man, but decided to prefer and favor him all the more on this account, for she herself, from childhood, had consorted with magicians and sorcerers, as her pursuits inclined her, Toward them in all her life she believed in the black art and had great confidence in it. They even say that it was not so much by flattery that she made Justinian eat from her hand as by demoniac power. For this was uh, not a kindly, just, or good man to prevail over such mach uh, machinations, but plainly overmastered by his passion for murder and money, easily yielding to those who deceived and flattered him, and in the midst of his fondest plans, he could be diverted with facility, like a bit of dust caught up by the wind. None of his kindred or his friends had any sure confidence in him, and his plans were continually subject to change. Thus he was an easy mark to sorcery, as I have said, and with no difficulty fell into the power of Theodora, and it was for this reason that the Empress regarded Peter, practice in such arts, with great affection. So it was all the emperor could do to remove him from office, uh, and at Theodore's insistence. Soon afterward, um, he made him chief of the treasurers, and removing John from his position, which he had given to him only a few months before. This man John was a native of Palestine, exceedingly good and gentle, ignorant of the possibility of increasing his private fortune, and had never wronged a single man. All the people loved him, and therefore he could not please Justinian and his wife, who, as soon as they saw among their agents an unexpected decent gentleman, became faint with horror, and determined to get rid of him at the first possible opportunity. Sound familiar, folks? So it was that Peter succeeded John as chief of the treasurers, and once more became the cause of great calamities, embezzling most of the monies which had been set apart since the time... Uh, since the time of a long past emperor to be distributed each year to the many poor, he made himself thus unjustly rich at the expense of the people, and handed a share of it to the emperor. Those who were thus deprived of their dole sat around in great grief. Furthermore, he did not coin the customary amount of gold, but issued a less amount, a thing that had never happened before, and this is how the emperor dealt with the magistracies. 23. How landowners were ruined. Uh, I will now tell how you ruined the landowners everywhere, although it were a sufficient indication of their sufferings to refer to what I have just written about the officials who were sent out to all the cities for these men plundered the landowners and did what other violence has been told. Now, it had formerly been that law 
the long-established custom that each Roman ruler should not only once during his reign, but often remit to his subjects whatever public debts were in arrears, so that those who were in financial difficulty and had no means of paying their delinquencies would not be too far pressed, and so that the tax collectors would not have the excuse of persecuting, as subject to the tax, those who really owed nothing. But Justinian, during 32 years' time, made no such concession to his subjects, and consequently those who were un unable had to flee their country and never return. Others, more prosperous, grew weary of trying to answer the continual accusation of the informers that the tax they had always paid was less than required by the present rate on their estates. For these unfortunates feared not so much the imposition of a new tax as that they should be burdened by the unjust weight of additional back taxes for so many years. Many indeed preferred to abandon their property to the informers or to the confiscation of the state. Besides the Medes and the Saracens had ravaged most of Asia and the Huns and Slavs all of Europe, captured cities had either been raised to their foundations or made to pay terrible tribute. Men had been carried off into slavery together with all their property, and every district had been deserted by its inhabitants because of the daily raids, yet no tax was remitted, except in the case of cities that had been captured by the enemy, and then only for one year, yet as if the emperor as the emperor anastasius had done he decided to yet if as the emperor anastasius had done he had decided to exempt the captured cities from taxation for 7 years even so i believe he would not have done as much as he should for cabades retired after doing hardly any damage to the buildings but kosros burned to the foundations everything he took and left greater ruin in his track Yet to these remaining sufferers, for whom he made his ridiculous remission of taxes, and to all the others who had many times been invaded by the army of the Medes, and had been continually plundered by the Huns and barbarous Saracens in the east, and to those Romans who had met an equal fate daily from the barbarians in Europe, this emperor straightway became a more bitter foe than all the barbarians put together, for as soon as the enemy had retreated, the landowners immediately were overwhelmed by new requisitions, imposts, and levies. What these were, I will now explain. Those who owned land were compelled to feed the Roman army according to a special assessment determined by the actual emergency, but arbitrarily fixed by law. And, if sufficient provisions for the soldiers and horses were not to be found on their estates, these unfortunates had to go out and buy them at an excessive price wherever they could, even if they had to transport them from a distant country to the place where the army was quartered, and then distribute them to the army officials, not at a legal price, but at the whim of the commanders. This requisition, called cooperative buying, took the heart out of the landowners, for it made their annual taxes easily ten times what they had been, as they had not only to feed the army, but often to transport grain from Constantinople. Barciamis was not the only one who dared this outrage, for the Cappadocian before him had done the same, and Barciamis's successors after him. And this is what cooperative buying meant. The impost was an unexpected ruin, which suddenly attacked the landowners, pulling up their hope of livelihood by the roots. In the case of estates that had run down and been deserted, whose owners and farmer tenants had either perished or left the country on account of their misfortune and disappeared, a ruthless tax was still laid on those who had already lost all. This was called the impost, levied frequently during this time. The nature of the third levy was briefly as follows. Many losses, especially at this time, were suffered by the cities, whose causes and extents I refrain from describing now, or the tale would be endless. These losses the landowners had to repair by special assessment on each individual, and their troubles did not even stop there. The pestilence, which had attacked the inhabited world, did not spare the Roman Empire. Most of its farmers had perished of it, so that their lands were deserted. Nevertheless, Justinian did not exempt the owners of these properties. Their annual taxes were not remitted, and they had to pay not only their own, but their deceased neighbor's share. And, in addition to all this, these land-poor wretches had to quarter the soldiers in their best rooms while they themselves during this time existed in the meanest and poorest part of their, dwell their dwellings. Quartering the troops... Think about it. 
Such were the constant afflictions of mankind under the rule of Justinian and Theodora. For there was no release from war or any of these calamities in all their time. While I am on the subject of quartering, I should not fail to mention that the householders in Constantinople had to quarter 70,000 barbarians so that they got no pleasure from their own houses and were greatly inconvenienced in many ways.